during the time he was an 11 year old boy and living in the Warsaw ghetto. And he was starving and he was, you know, obviously malnourished and miserable like everyone else there, fighting for his life. And one day he was lying on the sidewalk when a German Nazi officer came over to him and said to him, come with me, Jew, I need to see you over here. There was a Nazi officer who was lying on the ground about to draw his last breath. And this officer apparently had had some sort of a religious background and was feeling a deep sense of guilt and shame for the things that he had done, some of them quite heinous. And he decided that he was going to ask for forgiveness from this Jewish boy on behalf of his people. So it was an interesting thing because Simon Wiesenthal, the young boy, was called over there and as the guy begged him to forgive him on behalf of all his people, Simon Wiesenthal held his silence. He silently sat there and said nothing. After the war, he obviously survived and he wrote a story called The Sunflower. The Sunflower basically explains exactly what happened on that particular day but what it did was he turned it into a symposium where he invited world religions to come and weigh in. What would you have done in my place? What would you have done had you been in this situation? So almost uniformly, the Christians said that they would have granted forgiveness to the men. And almost uniformly, the Jews said, no, absolutely not. I wouldn't have forgiven them. And it was sort of split down the middle with the rest of the world religions. And it became the question, to whom do we give forgiveness and what should he have done? And so one of the things I wanted to talk about in today's webinar, which is on forgiveness from a Jewish perspective, really answers the question that if Simon Wiesenthal had been well enough and mature enough to know the answer at the time, he might have been able to say, I can't forgive you. One cannot forgive another person for what they did to somebody else. What this means is essentially this. Yom Kippur comes to offer us forgiveness between the sins that we do between us and God, the way that we behave in a way that goes against what God wants for his people. But there is absolutely no way that God is able to forgive us for that which we did to our fellow man. The meta message of this is that God, as it were, recused himself and made it impossible for him to grant forgiveness, as it were, to me if I hurt you or you or you. Only you can grant that forgiveness and only I can grant forgiveness to the person who hurt me. God can't do that. And I think there's something tremendously powerful in that. Because it says, and it shows us that the human being has such deep and profound power in the world. The ability even, as it were, to do that which God cannot or would not do. So I think we have to begin, as we puzzle out this idea, with the Socratean definition, right? Because the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. So what is forgiveness? So many people believe that forgiveness is something that you grant another when you understand why it happened and you have clarity and you can put it behind you intellectually or emotionally. But that in fact is not identical with forgiveness. Forgiveness is not for something that was understandable or an instance of clarity. Forgiveness is for that which is inexcusable and that's its power. The ability to forgive, the desire to stop, and here's that great quote, that holding a grudge and staying angry is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So that's quote number one, attributed to many different people, so there's no definitive about who said it. Some say Nelson Mandela, some say the Dalai Lama, I've heard a million different sources for it, but staying angry, holding a grudge is like 
eating poison and expecting the other person to die because we erroneously think that our rage and our fury and our desire to get even will somehow hurt the other person. It's an optical delusion of the self. The only person who truly suffers from grudge holding and the desire for revenge is us. Now, it is normal when one is angry to feel those feelings. But Judaism, of all the religions, does not believe in what is natural. We believe in elevating ourselves above the natural, the super, supra-natural. All of the commandments we have are given to us because we would do those things. It says, do not murder, because we would. It says, don't steal, because we would. It says, don't covet, because we would. It says, honor your parents, because we wouldn't. What's the message of this? That the normal and natural human condition has a baseline. But in Jewish ideology, that baseline is not sufficient. In order to live up to your potential as a human being, you must take these laws and use them to elevate yourself above the base and animal nature of the human condition when it's not refined. You, know, you have small children, they eat with their hands and they, you know, they, they interrupt and they don't share and they're, that's normal for a small child, but the parent's job is to train that behavior out of the child, to civilize them, so to speak. And Judaism, if it's anything, is an attempt to civilize the natural human condition post what happened in the Garden of Eden. And this time of year, it's particularly important to focus on forgiveness because one of the things that we learn is as we are willing to forgive others, that is how the heavenly court looks at us. It's a quid quo, a kind of mida connected mida, measure for measure. The way that we put our sensibilities out in the world will have a direct correlation to the way we are judged on Rosh Hashanah. So this is an interesting idea because, you know, books like talk a great deal about harnessing the power of the universe to get your needs met. But this is identical with that because we don't see the power of the universe as all of these waves that you can manipulate if you do the right thing. It's not like pressing the right buttons on a vending machine and getting the right candy bar because you, you put in the right coin. Instead, the purpose of being alive is to elevate your character. And as you are contributing to the human condition by refining your character and elevating your character traits, that is what's considered success from a Jewish spiritual point of view. In other words, not yelling when someone is rude to you is a greater victory than a Harvard MBA because everything else is phased out and passing. But the soul and the character of the soul, that's eternal. So there's a word in Greek called sugnome. Sugnome basically means forgiveness, and that's how it's translated. But what it really is, if you look at the ancient Greek, is it's exculpation or absolution. In other words, somebody did something to you, and you understand how and why it happened. Perhaps they had had a terrible diagnosis. Perhaps they had just heard awful news. Perhaps they had not had their glasses on, so they didn't see you when they walked right by you. But when you have this exculpation, when you have this sense of, ah, this isn't personal. This isn't about me. I don't have to take this to heart. Then we are able to let go and move on. But once again, Forgiveness in and of itself, and it's a state, and it's a process, is about when something has been unacceptable, when there is no clarification, when there is no good reason for it. And we do it not just for ourselves or for them. We do it not just to create peace. We do it because we understand what one of the hardest apologies we will ever have to accept is the one we'll never receive. The hardest apology you will ever have to accept is the one that you will never receive. 
we all will lose people. They'll go to their graves and there will not be clarity. There will be family situations, deep wounds and hurts, which in this lifetime, we may never understand why they happened. And that's why one of my favorite expressions is, when you understand that you can never understand everything there is to understand, then you understand. The idea is something that I noticed when I was watching all of those videos um, that were shot from space of the tornadoes as they whirled through the sky. As human beings, we now have the capacity to be above ourselves, looking down. It's like a GPS. Those of us who use Waze or other GPS systems know that there's this overarching eye that's watching out for us and helps direct us. For the Jew, that overarching eye, it's not a satellite dish. It's the God positioning system, that kind of GPS, where we are told what is the ideal form of human behavior, and we direct ourselves in accordance to that. So Franz de Waal, who was a primatologist, dealt with the great apes and the bonobos and the, the gorillas, noticed that from the beginning of his study of animals, that there were appeasement, peace behaviors, even in the great apes, that they had figured out systems where when there was trouble, one of the apes would acquiesce in order to create peace within the movement. So the animals have some deep form of social order as much as we do. But forgiveness, as we understand it, was first discussed in the Torah with the story of Joseph and his brothers. So for the sake of expediency, let me just remind you. Joseph was the beloved son of his father, the loved brother. You remember he had that technicolor dream coat. Joseph had these prophetic dreams and he liked to share them with his brothers. And some of them were dreams of the wheat chiefs bowing down to him and the sun and the moon bowing down to him. Delusions of grandeur, they thought, and they couldn't stand him. Aside from the fact that his mother was the beloved wife, there was such animosity towards him. And one day they couldn't take it anymore and they went out to the fields and found him in the desert and they decided to kidnap him and they were going to kill him. And at the last moment they decided, no, we won't kill him. We're just gonna put him in this empty pit. We're gonna dip his coat in animal blood. We're gonna take it back to our father, Yaakov. We're gonna tell him he was killed by an animal and we're gonna leave him to be kidnapped into slavery. And that's what they did. What they didn't know was shortly thereafter, Joseph was picked up by a band of Egyptians who took him back in their cart and he was thrown into prison, into a vile dungeon. And during his time in the prison, he continued having his dreams and he started to act as a dream interpreter. And his dreams were so prophetic and he had so much power even in the prison that ultimately he arrived at the Pharaoh, the king virtually, to analyze one of his dreams. And when he was successful in doing so, he was promoted to the viceroy of the country. Imagine this boy who was left for dead in a pit, went to a prison and in a matter of seconds was elevated literally from the dungeon to the palace. And he became the viceroy and ultimately he he became in charge of all food source and supply in Egypt at the time was the world's superpower. It controlled everything. The Nile River and the banks of the Nile River would overflow themselves regularly and the silt and the minerals in that water would irrigate the land so that the land was so rich that anything would grow there. It was one of the reasons that the first of the plagues that we talk about at Passover was the river turning to blood. They saw the river as a kind of a god because it was so enriching for their lives. So fast forward 20 years and the brothers are enduring a famine in their land and their father sends them down to Egypt to try and secure food to bring back so they can survive the famine. 
and they go to meet with the Viceroy of Egypt. And the minute Joseph looks at them, he knows exactly who they are. Unfortunately for them, they don't have a clue who they're talking to. So Joseph comes up with this elaborate scheme in order to find out if his brothers are still the creeps that they were who sold him into slavery, whether they've learned lessons about jealousy and bravery and cruelty, whether the years had taught them anything. And after a series of elaborate plots and plans and the attempt to kidnap one of their other brothers, after all this, what ended up happening was what we say, and sociologists concur, was the very, very first written example of forgiveness. So I'm going to read you the quote right out of the Torah right now. When the brothers and Joseph were finally reunited, Joseph says, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now, don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God just sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there'll be no plowing and there'll be no reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on this earth and to save your lives with great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here. It was God. Why is this forgiveness? So the rabbis teach us that what he did, Joseph, was he had his spiritual GPS. He understood the very famous Shema prayer, where we say Shema Yisrael, Adonai Lehenu, Adonai Echad, Hero Israel, God is one. What does it mean that God is one? It means that the good, the bad, the ugly, that which feels good and is terrible for you and that which feels terrible and might be good for you, that all of those things are under one supervision. And that even though we may never understand the pain, even though it will seem unfair, inexplicable, he believed there was something greater that was dictating the course of history. And so when his brothers finally came to him, he suddenly had this epiphany, aha, this is why this happened to me, so that 20 years later, I could save my family. This is the kind of spiritual certainty that very few of us, and certainly not me, could ever achieve. But even if, we acted as if, even if we said to ourselves, whatever's coming at me, the insult, the humiliation, the loss of job, the broken heart, any of those things that come to me from another human being, would I be able to forgive if I truly knew and believed that everything had its purpose and there was something for me to gain from it? And that's why we Jews believe that your greatness and your value in life is not what happens to you, but who you are and how you behave in the face of what happens to you. Who are you when the stuff hits the fan? How do you behave when you're insulted or offended, when someone wrongs you? How would you want someone to judge you if you blew it and we do? It's an interesting thing. When my older son was about, I don't know, 19, 18, he came to me with a list, a litany of all the parenting mistakes I'd ever made. And you did this, and you did this, and you did this, and I'll never forgive this. And he just went on and on and on. And I swear I cried for a week. I just, it ripped me apart because I was so sure I was going to parent differently than my mother. And I did. It just made different mistakes than the ones she made. But two years later, when the next son in line came to me with the same litany, I had a little bit more perspective. And I said to him, you know, Jax, I apologize for the pain that I caused you inadvertently. I only ever wanted to love you the way you needed to be loved. But now I'm going to teach you another important life lesson. 
I'm going to forgive myself because then you'll know how to do it when your kid comes to you years from now and pulls the same stunt. So the first step in forgiveness has to be the ability to forgive yourself. Because if you are a person who beats on yourself constantly, if you're incapable of letting go of your own errors, if you ruminate and go over them and let them color your choices, then you're going to have a much harder time extending that same charity to others. So you begin with yourself. Now, our sages tell us that there are three levels of willingness to forgive. And since it's Rosh Hashanah, and we're all looking to be written in the book of life, it's very useful for us to learn these techniques so that this kind of positive faith and judgment will be applied to us as we stand there on Rosh Hashanah. The first level of willingness to forgive others is some people forgive anyone, anyone who comes to them and asks for forgiveness. If you apologize, you're clean with me. Now, I once thought that was like a extraordinarily high level of forgiveness. That no matter what happened, if someone said, listen, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, I would let it go just because they apologize. But it's actually not the highest level. It's the base level. The second level is more interesting. It says there are others who go out of their way to meet those who wronged them, to make it easier for that person to ask for forgiveness. <laughs> like that's what we're going to do. A person treats you badly and insults you or hurts you or fires you or whatever it is. And you make sure to find yourself in their path in a social or a business situation and, and make nice so that, you know, they can say, listen, I'm really sorry about what happened. Because you know that they need to apologize. You know that a wrong was done to you. But you know they're proud and they're probably not going to do it. So you set it up for them. Well, who does that? Except mothers do that. I have a child who's very obdurate. He's, he's stiff-necked. He, he can't apologize. From the time he was little, it wasn't him. He didn't do it. Not me. Not I. He could never admit he was wrong, and he certainly could never apologize. But as a mother, I knew how important it was for him to learn to apologize because his wife, no matter how much he loved him, was not going to take what a mother takes. And his boss, no matter how good he was at his job, was not going to accept that kind of arrogance. It wasn't going to work. So I would do this thing. When this particular boy was really hideous, and I know and I knew he needed to apologize, and I was waiting for it, and nothing was forthcoming, I would do something like, I don't know, make his favorite dinner or buy him something that he had wanted, which you might think was rewarding bad behavior. But I actually had a meta message for him. Because when I did that, he would inevitably go, oh, mom, thanks for making this. It's so delicious. Oh, yeah, and sorry about the other day. And that was the best he could do. Was I would have to get him into a place where he could feel he could afford to give an apology. Many people so badly want their fellow to be in a state of grace that they set them up to succeed. That's the second level. And the third level are people who stayed explicitly every night in their nighttime Shema Yisrael, the prayer that we say at bedtime. And it goes like this. Master of the universe, I hereby forgive anyone who has angered or vexed me, or sinned against me, either physically or financially, against my honor or against anything that's mine, whether accidentally or intentionally, inadvertently or deliberately, by speech or by deed, in this incarnation, and we do believe in reincarnation, or in any other, any Israelite may no man be punished on my account. And may it be your will, Lord my God and God of my fathers, that I shall sin no more or repeat my own sins. Neither shall I anger you 
or do what's wrong in your eyes and the sins that I've committed erase in your abounding mercies, but not through suffering or serious severe illnesses. May the words of my heart and the meditation of my mouth be acceptable before you. Every single night, before we say the Bed Shema, the person on the highest level of forgiveness makes a statement, whether they mean it or not, offering forgiveness to those who have hurt them. And it burns a neural pathway of a forgiving nature into your head. And even though you may be faking it until you make it, it helps create, again, that pathway for thinking about cherishing and developing peace. In fact, it says in Proverbs, when your enemy falls, do not rejoice. So at this point, most people will say the typical thing, yeah, well, what about Hitler? <laughs> Can't we rejoice with Hitler who died? Or what about Saddam Hussein? Can't we rejoice then? Of course, there is room for us to rejoice when evil, true evil is eradicated. But the fact is, your ex-husband, your mother-in-law, they're not Saddam Hussein or Hitler. We have to recognize that human beings have foibles, they make mistakes, they cause pain, and we do too. And it's interesting to me that when we talk about the subject of forgiveness, Everybody can think of at least two people who owe them an apology. But very rarely do we go inside and ask ourselves, to whom do we owe an apology? To whom could we have caused pain and maybe not even know it? Now, you can't imagine how scary that is for me, given that just this summer alone, I spoke to 1,600 women. Surely there was at least 10 of them in that group who I offended somehow or another. Where something I said or something I did or I walked across the room and didn't see them and, and appeared to not say hello were hurt or offended by me. And I'll never be able to ask for forgiveness. Learning how to give and receive apologies is one of the highest forms of human greatness. And as the young Simon Wiesenthal did not understand at the time, it's the strength that only we can do. It says in the Mishnah Torah, it is forbidden to be obdurate, which means hard to appease, and not allow yourself to be appeased. On the contrary, one should be easily pacified and find it difficult to become angry. When asked by an offender for forgiveness, one should forgive with a sincere mind and a willing spirit. Forgiveness is natural to the seed of Israel. That's a big ask. Why is it that it's so difficult for us self is that sometimes when you are right and the other person is wrong, it gives you this perceived sense of moral superiority, that you've drawn this line in the sand, I'm right, he's wrong. I'm good, they're bad. I'm lofty, they're low. And many of us feel like we have so little that we cling on to even those sensations, those feelings of being in the right. It makes us feel like we have something over the other person. When we ourselves feel like we have so little. So it's really important to examine when we hold on to anger for other purposes. In the first decade of my marriage, if I would have a fight with my husband, on the off chance that he was in the wrong, because it was usually me, and he was trying to make up, he had a series of things he would do. First, he would put Kit Kat chocolate bars in the fridge, because I like them, and I like them cold. Then he would bring force home, he would speak nicely, he would basically suck up to me. And I was over being angry. But you know, I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> so I milked it, like a few days extra. I wouldn't let him out of the doghouse as fast as he might have deserved to come out, because it felt kind of good. 
And I used to say to myself, well, if things go back to normal, he's just going to start doing that again. So I may as well enjoy this as long as it can last. I'll punish him for a while longer. You know, I'm not an unusual woman. I do have some base feelings. I remember many years ago, I think I was 19, and a boy split up with me, broke up with me brutally, and went to go out with my best girlfriend. And uh, I used to have this reoccurring fantasy that his little car would drive off a cliff, and the last thing he would do was scream my name. I love you still. I couldn't bear the ultimate insult. His hardest thing to forgive, as Don Henley and the Eagles said, is to forgive someone even if, even if they don't love you anymore. And I would have this repetitive fantasy. So I went to see a psychiatrist because I felt so ashamed. Why am I murdering this guy off every night for four hours? And you know what he said? He said, listen, Miss Gold, if I had a dollar for every single woman who was jilted, who came in here with a death fantasy for their husband or ex-boyfriend, I'd never have to work again. And I remember feeling really relieved that I was normal. But once again, normal is not the level that we stick to as Jews. We want to go beyond that. I personally am deeply jealous by nature. It's one of my greatest flaws. So forgiveness for me has always been a very loaded thing. On one hand, I like peace and conflict-free places. On the other hand, I'm easily sparked to jealousy. So those two make a perfect storm. In terms of forgiveness, I've come to realize that even if it's not just to save my own skin, in other, oh, thanks, Jessica. In other words, even if it's not just to save my own hide, that my humanness is not an excuse for my low level of character. It just simply is not. And so I work on myself all the time, constantly. Now, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, said that there were three levels of forgiveness. And these three levels are different than the three ways of forgiveness that people give. This is the levels. And it says that in order not to be considered as though you're cruel, you must get at least to level one. Level one. We don't wish the person any harm. We even pray for their well-being. At this basic level of forgiveness, you might still be upset, feel hurt, or even angry. Yet we find it within ourselves not to hope for the person's downfall and not to feel the need for revenge. Now, when I discuss this with people, they always say the same thing. Oh, I would never do that. But we do. We do. You can't tell me that someone who's divorced doesn't secretly hope that their ex never remarries until they do or never finds love again when they've broken their heart. We do. It was like my fantasy of killing off the ex-boyfriend. You got to get yourself, says the Talmud, to at least the first level or else you are considered cruel. That first level is best illustrated in the Fiddler on the Roof movie. Remember when the Hasidim go to the Rebbe and they say, Rebbe, Rebbe, there's a blessing, a bracha for everything. Tell me, is there a blessing for the evil czar? And the rabbi says, of course there is. May God bless and keep the czar far away from us. And that, Melissa, you're nodding. That, bracha, that is level one of forgiveness. And whenever I am feeling murderous or revengeful, that is the song that plays in my head. Get yourself to a place where you can say, I'm still angry. I need to set up boundaries. You can't be part of my life. But I at least don't wish you will. I can at least say myself, you should be well, but far away from me. And that, says the Talmud, is the baseline you have to get to. Level two. You stop being angry. At the second stage, you might not be ready to relate to the person the way you did before, 
but you're able to move on and let go to the point where you no longer carry feelings of anger and resentment on any level. Which means that if you see them in the store, you don't have to hide behind a rack. And if you walk into a party, you don't have to walk out the back door if they're there. And you might even be able to say hello civilly and then keep walking. You're not ready for a relationship, but you've really gotten rid of the anger, the heat, if you will, that color of the situation has dissipated and you are able to, you know, move on from the anger, but you're not ready for any kind of reconciliation. The third level of forgiveness and this is considered the highest, is the restoration of the relationship. And he says, at this final stage, the forgiveness is complete. Not only have we forgiven the individual, but we've totally understood and reaccepted them into our lives. We are ready to be as close to the offending person as we were before. Now, I'd like to say that there are situations where this can never occur. In situations of abuse, situations of danger, in situations of toxicity so intense that that person can never be re-entered into your life. When you go into bad weather, you need to put on a raincoat. If something is dangerous for you, you must create fences around it to keep it away from you because the highest form of Jewish adherence is to save a life. And sometimes that life is your own that you're saving. However, when it comes to long-term interpersonal relationships, with your children, with your parents, with a spouse, in friendships. Those relationships, as I explained in, and you tie them, and there's a knot there. And then they get severed again, and then you knot them again, and severed again, and you knot them again. And by the end of a long life relationship, with the person, there are a multitude of not. Go look at my only pearl necklace, a good one that I inherited from my mother-in-law. And I noticed that between every pearl, there's a knot. Those knots protect the string of pearls. If it breaks, there's no cascade of pearls destroyed and running across the floor. Those knots, in fact, make the necklace stronger. Forgiveness means tying a knot and recognizing the relationship as a pearl. And while you may not ever get to level three, tie those knots we must over and over and over in our lives. And at this time of year, when we are so desperately in need of forgiveness ourselves, when we want so badly to be written into the book of life, when there are people that we may have hurt that we don't have clue that we hurt them, people who are holding a grudge against, and there are people who have done that to us, we cannot afford not to work on this powerful trait. We can't afford to stay obdurate, stuck in our ways. So my suggestion is, from between now and Rosh Hashanah, there's very little time. Ask yourself, is there a relationship, and don't take on more than one, maximum two, because if you take on too much, you're just not going to succeed, and that will demotivate you. Is there a relationship where forgiveness from you would be required? And what can you do? How can you use your GPS, your God positioning system? How can you take a more overarching look at the situation to accept the humanity and fallibility of those around us and get at least to level A with those people. Might you want to reach out to them before the high holidays just to send a quick Happy New Year message, something that they wouldn't expect. I was just thinking about you today. I wanted to wish you a Shana Tova. And if it's not a Jew, I was just thinking about you today. I hoped you were well. Something 
small. It says in the Torah that if you open for me an aperture, a hole like the eye of a needle, that God will broaden it so that wagons can move through it. Before Rosh Hashanah, I advise all of us to make an opening of forgiveness. And in doing so, my prayer for all of us is that God and the heavenly court will look upon us with mercy and forgiveness. And that we should see peace and a greater sense of unity in this horrible divided world we live in now. That there won't be another Charlottesville. That people who are hurting will be safe. That pain can be rectified and that we can all live with meaning. So I wanna thank you and I wanna tell you all of you who are on, if I have caused you any pain, you must reach out to me, Adrian G, A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E, Adrian G at jwrp.org. Tell me what I need to ask for forgiveness for and give me an opportunity to make amends. And try and ask your own friends. Say you want to clear the slate before the new year. And you'd be surprised how many of them might ask you the same. So we've used up our time. Does anyone want to share anything before we go? Because I'm here. Just unmute yourself if you want to speak. And if not, I send you really my heartfelt prayers for a good, healthy new year for you and for everyone that you love. Tova. To you too, to everyone. Good night. Good night.